So I'm going to talk to you about food and class in fact and fiction films in the First World War. Um, and I'm going to show you a number of film stills. I didn't um, risk showing you an actual film because I've been there so many times and it doesn't work um, at the crucial moment. So uh, I'm actually, I've broken the film down uh, as much as I can into individual images. Um, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that the main film we're going to look at is Everybody's Business, um, but I've also got some uh, short factual films as well. Um, and I'm going to suggest that these films were divisive, reinforcing obsolete and bourgeois lower class stereotypes, uh, purporting to urge the nation to make even greater sacrifices in the kitchen, thus further alienating the working class. So I think that's something that was picked up on a little bit this morning as well. So in the Second World War, just start there and jump back, um, the campaign for Dig for Victory was introduced fairly early on. Um, in fact, one month after the outbreak of war, so they were, you know, really, you know, hot on the game with that. Um, in an attempt to feed the nation, and, pe and people were persuaded to convert their gardens into allotments. And the Second World War campaign was professional at the outset. It was done in a very professional way, particularly in terms of the films. And there were numerous newsreels, documentaries, um, and visual imagery um, around. And as I say, the plan was mobilised at short notice as well. And this owes a debt, in some respects, to developments that took place in the First World War. So the main disparity with the two campaigns is... Um, their strategies in dealing with people. So the Second World War was deemed the People's War, I'm sure you've probably all heard that, um, which was an attempt to get everyone on board by disregarding class difference. I mean, I'm sure it didn't really do that, but lots of films like In Which We Serve um, have all um, strata of society um, trying to work together for the good cause. Uh, World War I, on the other hand, operated a top-down system. In fact, both fact and fiction films um, treated the working classes as if they needed educating. So it was a kind of top-down approach. And this is despite the fact that the cinema audience was predominantly working class. So you've got this kind of music hall tradition where people um, were regular attenders and then moved into go, regularly going to the cinema. So it's targeting those people who were really pulling their weight and were actually digging for victory. You know, that was the kind of irony of it. So um, in terms of some background, and I know this has been talked about a little bit this morning, um, the food crisis didn't begin in the First World War. It actually um, began prior to that period in the, in the Victorian period. Um, and Britain had already experienced an agricultural depression. So actually both Britain and Germany were reliant on imports. Um, so by 1914, the government realised the need to increase its own domestic supplies. And at the outbreak of war, the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, established a, a cabinet committee on food supplies with the idea of protecting the national food store. So um, initially, domestic production was quite high, um, but later in the war, um, there was a decline in um, uh, crop production, potatoes, um, and animal husbandry was threatened. So, um, after the coalition government with uh, Lloyd Asquith and Lloyd George in uh, May 1915, the county war agricultural committees um, were formed, consisting mainly of wealthy county landowners. And these were um, tended to be um, either landowners or wealthy farmers, agriculturalists, um, and all these people were responsible for national food production. 
So this had political ramifications and many believed there was a middle class bias on the food control. So these committees set up by the government to oversee food distribution. And by 1917, starvation was a serious threat to Britain. And the main victims were the poorer members of society. So a consumer council was established to express customer concerns, and in particular those of the organised working class. And then from this point on there was increased regulation um, in agriculture um, and a heightened operation um, which developed. So there was an urge for a more vigorous and strident propaganda aimed at the masses and where necessary outright fabrication. So coming along now to film and, and the various forms of propaganda, there was um, a variety of media to encourage voluntary rationing. So posters, newspapers, uh, pamphlets, novels, postcards. And from 1916 onwards, the cinema became a very important propagandist tool. Um, so, as I say, cinema was a continuation of the music halls, and this had attracted the working classes. So, cinema was um, an ideal venue to propagate this kind of doctrine. And food films for, formed part of this more extensive operation. And this figure, sorry, going back to the last one, Charles Masterman was um, an important person, not only for film, but also for um, official war art as well. So um, in 1916, then, we get this um, cinematograph committee established under Lord Beaverbrook. He was the chair of it. Um, and um, the, minist sorry, the Ministry of Information um, cooperated to uh, produce a number of regular bi-weekly newsreel films shown in cinemas. So the Ministry of Information then had its own studios and it used professional filmmakers and produced regular bi-weekly newsreels which were shown in cinemas. And part of the remit was films that were aimed at um, recruitment for women, so women's land army films. And um, military recruitment from rural areas had resulted in the depletion of agricultural labour, um, particularly the trained workforce. So um, a lot of kind of skilled um, labour from rural areas had actually um, enlisted. So from May 1915, the War Office forbade the further enlistment of skilled farm workers uh, because they were needed to train new recruits. And these new recruits were to be women and children during the school holidays, um, and the age of the school leaving age was actually lowered to 11 uh, during this period. So uh, children from 11 to 14 um, were recruited, and prisoners of war. Um, so um, recruitment appeals went out to encourage women to engage in animal husbandry. And um, war agricultural committees were set up under the Board of Agriculture to try to attract middle class women into farm labour. And one of the reasons was that the middle class women would then act as educators to people who were already living in the country, people who were already doing this kind of farm work, which is a point I think uh, Karen made earlier, um, and work in an educative capacity. So in other words, they wanted the middle classes to take a position of authority. <clears throat> but recruitment was limited, and in 1917, um, the board was reorganised to form the Women's Land Army. And then a number of newsreels were, were um, produced to encourage conscription. 
And these newsreels are, are quite interesting because, I mean, I spent some wonderful time at the um, Imperial War Museum going through all these old films. And if anybody ever goes to work there, it's fantastic because you just end up in a room by yourself watching endless films. And it's, uh, for me, it was heaven. So, um, But um, this, these films are, are quite interesting in the kind of message that they um, try to get across. So it shows women in hitherto... Um, areas that you know they, they perhaps wouldn't have um, ventured into before like driving tractors and often they're dressed in military outfits to show their participation in the war effort. Women land workers, sorry about this written across the bottom but I couldn't do anything other. Um, the, often these images, these little short films, they're, sometimes they're only a couple of minutes long, um, show um, the, the kind of good times that can be had in these kind of activities. So, you know, forget the mud, forget the hard work, forget, you know, the, the heavy lifting duties. Um, you're going to have a really good time. You're all going to be together and you're all going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of camaraderie um, and um, you, you obviously, you know, the idea is you're helping the war effort, but often these images are romanticised. They're, they're given a kind of, you know, a poetic quality almost um, to make it a very appealing um, type of, of work so um, so this one shows the women dressed in dungarees smiling um, um, and it goes on while they hoe crops and things like that they're all chatting away and uh, we don't really see um, the the hard work that's involved sorry can you see that <laughs> um, so, and, and of course, the other thing that was attractive about this is that a lot of women would be on their own. Their husbands would be away at war um, and, uh, or their partners or, or families. And um, it, it gave them, you know, a way of kind of participating in group activities, a way of actually seeing other people. So um, it was made to sort of look very attractive as opposed to the solitary existence that they might be having. So by 1918, the need for self-sufficiency um, became more intense um, as the fear of food shortages increased. And there was a push to be more productive with farm animals. So there's lots of films then on animal husbandry and uh, kind of looking after animals and, and uh, uh, in an attempt to um, encourage um, women to join up and to actually work on farms. I mean, in reality, it wasn't a particularly attractive proposition because the munitions uh, factories paid a lot more money. And um, also a lot of the women were from urban areas. So, you know, it wasn't that attractive to don a pair of wellies and, and go out into the countryside. But it was, it was seen as a kind of very rewarding activity. So... Um, Films like Hogs for Food um, shows these two women, they're obviously smiling at the camera anyway because it was a kind of bit of a novelty, um, but they're showing their participation in the military campaign and part way through we see them holding small piglets in their arms which is a kind of um, suggestion that they're, they're the nurturing people at home, um, you know, uh, taking care of society. Uh, but, you know, also these sort of lovely romantic images in this, you can't see it that well, but it's set in, a, in an orchard and uh, the, the, it shows children playing. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, kind of nice things to be had from the countryside, according to this film. So this film opens with a shot of sunlit rolling fields um, and a woman leading a small herd of goats towards the camera. Um, and then later we get this idyllic orchard scene and there's children playing um, and she, she goes on to milk one of the goats. Um, and it suggests that this kind of rural freedom um, and, and obviously use of landscape, which we know is really important in terms of patriotism, is in the hands of the workers on the home front. So these are the, some of the factual films, and there's lots, lots more. If you just Google in Path A Films, you can come up with a lot of um, images um, in, in these films. Uh, on these films, sorry. Um, but the fiction films of the period were also used um, 
to suggest that the upper and middle classes um, were the ones who were, um, dig who were saving the country and digging for victory. Um, and the other point really about these factual films is that it wasn't really what people wanted to see either. They, they wanted to go to the cinema and have escapism and there were a lot of um, Hollywood films being shown at the time. So there was a lot of people who wanted to, um, would prefer not to watch, you know, films about the war or about enlistment. And um, it was discovered that Mel melodramas and um, films with a, a good plot were much more appealing to the audiences. So, um, and, and also few people enjoyed seeing their own humble existences on screen. So the, the films didn't tend to be particularly uh, based on kind of realism, a bit like, you know, we, we know the, f the films of Ken Loach at the moment and uh, people like Mike Lee. Um, they tended to be um, much more focused on an affluent lifestyle. Women's Land Army keeping pigs. There you are, you see, nurturing. <laughs> nurturing in the First World War. Um, you know, probably a very difficult <laughs> job for somebody uh, who's uh, come, come from the city. So um, the public um, got most satisfaction then from stories about people um, like themselves had been behind many a film of lower class life before the war, but the recent practice was for the producer to let his audience identify themselves with superior people. And one of the reasons that um, some of these films were made is because there was growing concern about the way that the upper classes were actually living and enjoying a wealthy lifestyle. There'd been all sorts of newspaper uh, reports um, about these, these kind of issues, um, which, um, you know, resonated really with a society that were having to self-ration and, you know, were on the verge of starvation. Yeah, the working class then perceived that the upper and middle classes were still living well. So there's this constant accentuation of class divisions um, and the idea that um, the rich are getting, you know, uh, all the foods they need and that the poor people aren't. And a notorious newspaper article at the time uh, reported on this, um, entitled How They Starve at the Ritz, Ritz um, suggested that food, shortage, f sorry, food shortages also magnified Britain's deep social inequalities. Rumours of the wealthy hoarding food provoked rowdy, rowdy demonstrations in Yorkshire. Uh, some of London's East End families survived on a diet of tea, etc., etc. Um, and this Daily Herald report um, in 1917 said that uh, diners at the Ritz were able to consume six course dinners and it lists some of the food. So you can see how this would really kind of annoy and aggravate at the time. And of course it was up to the government to try and dispel these myths and suggest to the contrary. So they um, issued a report stating that um, at the end of the report it said, I hope these notes will put an end to the miserable suspicions entertained by the lower orders, um, that the rich are better off than themselves in wartime. Um, uh, the war we know has levelled everyone, which of course, you know, wasn't true at all. Um, and the fallacy is obvious. So, um, you know, the government then getting afraid really because there had been you know a series of uh, strikes um, and things like that so there's this kind of fear um, that the there'll be this uprising from the working classes and uh, that it'll affect people's desire really to cut back on on food whereas in reality the um, upper middle and upper classes seem to be making very little effort at all 
Um, so all this is encapsulated in a film which is uh, a Cecil Hepworth film. He did a wonderful film in 1905, I think it is, called Rescued by Rover, which is a fabulous film. You must uh, watch it if you can. It's sure to be on YouTube. Um, and uh, he, he directed this film, which is called um, Everybody's Business. Um, and um, in it, he suggests that it's the middle classes that are there to um, educate the working classes. The working classes are pretty hopeless. Um, the, they, they don't really know how to cut back on food. And um, they're also thieves. Um, and they're responsible for the deaths in the trenches as well. So I'll, I'll show you how that's actually done in the film. So it starts off, I haven't broken the whole film down, uh, but I've put a YouTube link at the very end, which you could have a look at if you want to see it. Um, so it starts off, we've got this sort of wealthy, opulent room. It's 1917. You can see that these people are well to do. The film starts off introducing them individually. And of course, it's the start of the um, sort of period when we're, we have stars in cinema as well. And that was particularly the case in Hollywood. But there's also an element of that here because a lot of these people were um, music hall, theatre people, and were well known people as well. Um, so. Um, this, um, I think it's, uh, no, sorry, I'll, I'll move on to that in a minute. Um, so yeah, we've got this wealthy kind of um, abode here. We've got these people who live in, you know, quite uh, opulent conditions. Um, we're introduced to the daughter Mabel, um, Mabel Britton. So obviously they're representative of, of your average British family. Um, and Mabel uh, swans in wearing this, you know, her, her furs and things. So again, we can see they're quite wealthy. And we're told she's a munitions worker. So she's doing her bit for society. She's, she, you know, she's helping to win the war. Um, and there's some lovely inserts in the film as well when they go into documentary footage of um, things like munitions factories. So we get um, kind of further information that way. It makes it even more sort of propagandist. Um, and um, anyway, she's come in with some news that her brother and her brother's friend, who's actually her boyfriend, are um, coming home on leave. And the Britton family decide, it's Mr Britton's birthday, and they decide they're going to have a big party, they're going to have a lovely meal um, for the family um, and uh, as a celebration. But <laughs> on the other hand, we've got the lazy and slovenly staff and um, the image goes from the, the um, industrious Mabel who's, you know, just come in to um, this image of the cook and the housemaid. And when we first encounter them, they're uh, sitting gossiping together. They're not um, working at all. The housemaid's sitting on the table waiting. Um, well, she's actually looking at a locket that the cook wears of her son who's in the trenches. Um, so that's an important prop. We, we encounter that later on. Um, and we know that they should be working because the minute Mrs Britton goes to tell them um, that they're having this special meal, uh, they jump up and they look guilty. So we can see that they are, you know, the, the ones that aren't really pulling the weight. They're the lazy ones and it's the Britton family that are really holding this war together. And then um, Mrs Britton says to Cook, we want, um, we want a, a a Spartan kind of meal. We can't have this, we can't have that. Um, she dictates what they've got to have. So Mrs. Britton is, you know, a, quite a powerful figure really, and she's actually dictating the kind of meal they have. Um, and Cook says, sorry, we've lost some of this, is that sufficient for an occasion like this? Um, uh, sorry, Cook says to her, is that enough? You know, is that, is that enough food? And Mrs. Britton says, um, yes, that'll be all right for a wartime menu. In the meantime, Mr. Britton says, oh no, you know, we've got to have a, a proper feast. So he overrides Mrs. Britton and um, tells Cook to cook this really nice meal. 
Um, but in the meantime, you know, what, what are these people doing in the kitchen? You know, the um, cook and gardener um, have to have advice from Mrs. Britton because the gardener comes in, we see him coming in, and he's got in his bucket some seed potatoes you know that's a complete no-no because -no, seed potatoes are the seeds so you know he's eating the kind of basis of the crop if you like so um, Mrs Britton tells him off you know he's, he should know better um, and uh, so it goes on these, these people in the kitchen really don't know what they're doing you know potato peelings as soon as she's found the seed potatoes then she's she finds these potato peelings with too much potato left on and she tells cook that she must peel them more um, and cook's getting pretty annoyed by this time <laughs> um, and then we get this close-up so what's really interesting in terms of film is that Hepworth now is beginning to see the importance of the use of the close-up to um, enable the spectator to see exactly what's going on so these are things we take for granted now in film and you know when we're watching film we get a close-up of things but in actual fact um, you know it's really important that um, Hep Hepworth is is really working on telling a story through his images and then you know oh, you know not again you know there's uh, we found bread in the bin now so Cook's further told off for this so you can see where this is going that um, Cook in, and the, all the kitchen staff aren't saving the country they're not working for the dig for victory campaign uh, and, um, you know, as if to reinforce this, the intertitle says, really, Cook, you must stop wasting bread like this in wartime. So, um, again, um, you know, Cook's told off. And we're under no um, Ill illusion as to who's in the wrong. We know that it's the kitchen staff who aren't doing their bit. But there is a little bit of a problem with... Mr. Britton as well. Oh, so, so when they leave, they all look, sit, they sit around again and don't do anything. Um, and they're, but they're all pretty fed up. You know, they're all, you know, uh, duly admonished, really. And in the meantime, the film's quite um, inventive in a way because Mr. Britton has a dream. I haven't put all this in, so um, Mr. Britton has a dream. And in his dream, um, the uh, various campaigns, uh, we, we see f uh, footage of um, the U-boats bombing uh, ships. We see various different footage of, um, you know, various disasters at the front. And... Um, he begins to see the errors of his ways. He begins to see that he's made this big mistake and, and uh, he, he's got to change. But all this is his dream taking place. Um, so we see this is all kind of inserted for the audience to know what they've got to do, what action they've got to take. Um, and in his dream, you've got images of the rich and poor um, almost paralleled, really. You've got the wealthy dining, and they look at their bread and think, oh, no, we can't eat this whole piece of bread, and they divide it up. And likewise, the poor people do exactly the same. And this is quite a nice image here because you've got their son who's away at the trenches so they're you know doing their bit they're, the education is now beginning to be uh, disseminated and, and passed down to the working classes and um, <coughs> father comes to his senses when he wakes up he realizes it was all a dream and he realizes I, I like this bit because he realizes that he's made a mistake and he kind of begins to take charge then but poor old cook he gets cook into the room and gives her a good telling off well it was him that said to her um, you know we've got to have a, a meal fit for heroes but in actual fact he then gives her a really good telling telling off um, and this, this is quite nice as well because you've got uh, Mabel here, she's got a little dog and she's been feeding the dog a bit of bread. So that's a little sort of uh, uh, dig really at the middle classes if you like. But she immediately puts, almost throws the dog down <laughs> so you know, she realises you can't be feeding um, dogs like that. So. And then, then you get these, this is the newspaper that he's reading. So again, you get this close-up of this image 
saying what's going to happen if we don't cut back on eating bread um, and if we don't self-ration. And again, um, close up again of the newspaper article. Um, and these thoughtless civilians, you know, who are they? Are, you know, which class are these people? And we're led to believe that um, Mr. Britton made a little bit of a mistake, but in actual fact, it's the kitchen staff who are really to blame. And um, the culprits, they're, they're actually summoned. We get these close-ups of the bells all the time be, when they're being summoned. And um, poor old Cook, who's son is away at war is really reminded of that when Mr Britton bang, you know says you know your son's out in the trenches and uh, he's uh, he's going to die if you, if you don't stop um, not peeling potatoes properly and things like that so equating those two kinds of things and then Nice shot to reinforce that is a close-up, an extreme close-up of her son in the trenches. And of course, poor Cook then goes to pieces and realises the error of her ways. And um, so then he says, every time you waste food, you're helping to keep him in the trenches. That's the intertitle that's uh, put up on the screen. So she then rushes off. Uh, but in the meantime, the gardener's there. We get this image of the gardener stealing bread off the table that he puts in his pocket. Um, and uh, then a cut back to the family who are rejoicing because they've got these posters uh, that they've been issued that they can put up on their garden walls, um, it says, it tells us. So um, the Eat Less Bread uh, posters... And Cook then goes back to inform her staff about, you know, what, they, what they've done. And so she then um, passes that information down through to the other domestic staff. And she says, like your blessed impudence, do you think I'm going to have the likes of you keeping my boy in them awful trenches? So it's a sort of, um, you know, Mr. Britton's words have had an effect. And the gardener returns his stolen bread. So um, the film ends then with um, the intertitle, um, The Hand of Britain Signs, meaning Mr. Britton, but of course it's got wider implications and um, the camera sort of scrolls down to include the whole of this um, and it scrolls down to say that uh, he'll um, sign you know for um, abstaining certain kinds of food and things like that um, so um, am I about out, out of time <laughs> okay so um, in sum, then, I'll read this out as well. The ruling classes are largely sensible and industrious, and even Mr Britton eventually sees the folly of his, of his ways. However, it takes greater persuasion to coerce the working classes into being less wasteful. Ultimately, the unspoken message is that the gentry must lead the way in the crusade to save food. A fatalistic approach is taken with Cook, whose son will surely die if she continues with her improvidence. And in 1917, the Minister of Food noted the importance of making all classes of the community realise the urgent necessity of avoiding waste of food in every form. Um, so that this film might operate as propaganda aimed at the working class seems surprising given its focus and treatment of the working class. But Hepworth permits the spectator identification with the characters in the film through his use of close-ups and choice of actors. Um, Gwyn Herbert, who plays the cook, was well known, had appeared regularly in films and was already a kind of sort of well-known star, so people can identify with them. Gerald du Maurier, um, who was the son 
um, Daphne du Maurier's father in real life, um, and Matheson Lang, who's the boyfriend of Mabel, were also ce stage celebrities. So it further mobilised a sense of intimacy with these characters, this kind of notion of identifying with people we kind of think we know. Um, so these stars then were offered as leading, uh, were leading lights in the film industry, um, but also the film offered an aspirational lifestyle away from poverty through fine clothes and interiors. So you know we know that the cinema um, and film offers escapism, and 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 this was presented in this film. Um, and uh, finally, then um, the food campaign films seem divided into two camps, the straightforward tag documentary aimed at the working class to show ways in which they could contribute to food production and help win the war, and secondly through fiction films which offered drama, romance, stars, an insight into middle and upper class lifestyles and sometimes comedy while still conveying a propagandist message. And that's, if you can see that, that's the link if you want to watch it. It's in two reels and it's on YouTube. 